Hey everybody, Tommy Craft here, writer, director, executive producer, and pretty much everything else on Star Trek Horizon. I'm here to bring you another VFX pipeline tutorial. If you saw the first one, it was very long, and it covered a lot of the effect shots in our opening scene, which is available on YouTube. Link is up there. And this time we're going to be looking at some of the shots from the trailer. And the link is also up there in the description and annotations on the screen. And um, we're basically just going to be going over the basic process to go from starting these shots and finishing them. So what I have up here is scene 75. And you can see this shot in the trailer. And it's when this group of ships goes to warp. So let's go ahead and take a look at it. Some nice lens flares there. Could maybe use a few thousand more. So let's go ahead and jump into 3DS Max and take a look at it. Okay, so here we are in 3DS Max. And as you can see, we've got a bit of a complex setup here. A lot of polygons going on, a lot of objects. And if we just scrub through the scene, we can see the, uh, the shot basically as it is in the trailer. There's no background, of course. And you see these weird things like these spheres here. And I'll go over what those are for when we get there. And now the ships are warping away, and there's the warp trail. But you notice there's only one warp trail. Let's just go ahead and scrub back to the beginning. And while we're here, we'll also pop into After Effects and take a look at the render passes and how this whole thing is set up. And so if we jump here into the main composition, if you will, for the shot, uh, there's a lot of layers here. And we're running at quarter resolution so that we don't slow things down too much. And let's just jump right back here to the first frame so we can get our bearings. And we'll go from the bottom. We'll start up from the very bottom. And we'll just take a quick look at all the render or all the different layers. So first off, we have star fields. And go ahead and solo some of these here. And uh you can see as we pass them, we also have motion blur enabled for everything. And this is a 3D imported camera from 3DS Max, which allows me to build the star fields in After Effects. And I'll come back to that as well. And we'll go ahead and turn on the rest of the star fields. As we pan over, there they are. And the camera zooms out. And now we have... This adjustment layer, which is just a slight curves adjustment to give a bit of a brightness change. And the reason for this is when you uh, have motion blur, the stars tend to dim out quite a bit. And so, for instance, right around here, uh, when we're doing this big zoom out, I do quite a uh, color correction on the stars to brighten them up a lot as we zoom out. And also, just because as we're zoomed out, they're smaller, farther away, so it's harder to see the, the contrast. And now, we will jump into our Earth layer. And this is another area where Render Passes comes in very handy. I have not just rendered out the planet from 3ds Max. I've rendered out... Uh, well, I have rendered the planet. I have not just rendered out the completed planet from 3ds Max. I've rendered each component separately. So to start here, we have the land mass. And it looks pretty crappy. And next we have clouds. And also a little trick here is you can do cloud shadows in 3ds Max, but I find that this uh, tends to work a little better depending on the shot. And so let's just go ahead and unhide those. And what I've, or hide those, and what I have here is I've taken the cloud layer, and this is a render of just the clouds. And I'm essentially inverting the colors on the base and then using the cloud layer as a luma mat so we get these nice shadows under the clouds. Nice way of earth, cloud shadows, and another pass of cloud shadows. And we have the actual clouds. And now it's starting to look a little bit better. Let's go ahead and turn that off because it's annoying. And now we have the Atmosphere Pass from 3DS Max, really starting to get there, but not quite all the way there. And now this is really 
kind of the final touch, which I think adds a lot. It's the final atmosphere pass in After Effects, which is just a gradient ramp. And if we unsolo everything else, that's all it is right there with a mask. And now we come up to the main comp of the ships. And if we go inside here, we see all of our render passes for the ships themselves. And we'll start at the bottom. We have the RGB color, which is... Now, if you really want to build up from the base, you will use a diffuse filter pass, which looks like this. It's literally just the colors and texture maps from your scene. And there's no speculars, no reflections, no lighting, no nothing. This is the base render of every scene. Now, you can start with that and build up, but what I find is faster and usually works just as well, if not better, is to start with the RGB color pass, which is the basic render out of 3ds Max with all of the basic layers already on top. And what we're doing is we're just augmenting them. So if we come in here with our base RGB color layer, we'll turn on the self illumination, bump up the res here. And this is uh, our windows and our deflector dish. And I've got a slight glow on that, which is hard to see here, but it'll, when it gets closer to the frame, you'll see it more. And also over here, you can see it. And we have the reflection pass. I really like reflection passes. Doubling up on these adds a lot to your scene. And we had one more reflection pass in there. And you can see over here, because uh, it's basically using your specular maps, and how much of a difference it makes in bringing out the detail on your ships. And this is reflections off, reflections on. And it's important to note, too, that our renders out of Max already have these, uh, when we're using the RGB color layer, it already has these built in. But what we're doing is essentially doubling up, or in this case, actually tripling on them. And now we have our specular pass. And this is very similar to the reflection pass. And if you look at the specular itself, this is our spec pass. And this is our reflection pass. And this is the difference. They are very similar. But the difference is very important in getting a good look. Now I've taken the diffuse filter here, and at some point in the render, I just fade it on a bit right here so that we don't bloom out too much in our highlights. And now, because when I originally did this shot, the decure model was not finished, so I had to render that separately, and so now that's in there. And we have all of the similar passes for our Dakir. And in, with this model, I've actually taken the specular passes and used them as a sort of bloom layer. If we just start with the first one, we have a specular pass with a blur of 12, and then another one with a blur of 22. And that gives you a nice highlight bloom on your reflections and speculars. And then up here, I have a curves which is animated on later and another curves and exposure. And these are just various lighting effects. And so now we're back in our main comp where everything is coming together. And next we have the fringe layer, and this is also a pre comp. And this is where I have done chromatic aberration or otherwise known as fringing. And this basically happens with some camera lenses where the bright spots will fringe into their separate colors and you can see it here and the way this is done is pretty simple we just take each we take a path we take the specular pass because we only want to do this to the highlights and we split it into three layers of individual colors so we have a blue layer a green layer and a red layer and we move them separately apart and so back in our whole composite starting to come together now we also now have these warp trails which are the particle effects rendered out of 3ds max to their own separate layers i've added some curves effects and some glows to kind of help bring out the colors a bit and now we have a warp flare layer 
And this is where I've taken all of these light sources, which I brought over from 3DS Max, and they're basically stuck to the ships. And they're used to give us this nice lens flare, um, which I'm sure is already pissing off a lot of people uh, on the ships. And as the engines power up and things get more and more active, the, the flares get brighter. And I'm just using a basic uh, bunch of video copilot optical flares elements here. And they are tracking the lights and they're starting with the light names. And this is our just basic flare here. And we have uh, light sources on all of the ships for it to track. And I also have a light source for the sun. Now the sun in this shot is very much off in the distance. So what we're seeing is just this slight glint as it passes above the camera. And that's once, once again a light source brought over from 3ds Max. And you can see the other lights here moving into position. And now... If we just go ahead and turn these back on. We have this adjustment layer, which is a radial blur. And when the ships warp, the edges of the frame kind of blur a little bit as the camera turns just to help give it some more motion. And you can see it without the blur and with the blur. And now we have the final layer. And I believe I talked about this in the last tutorial as well. This, uh, I always kept everything off with a glow. And oftentimes it's a very subtle glow. And also I add, and actually in this uh, particular shot, the glow intensity is keyframed. And also I add these fast blurs and these sharpens with very low amounts. And what this does is it helps blend your edges together a bit, where especially in a CG render, you tend to get very sharp edges. And this will actually kind of soften them a bit and make it look like it's more of a real camera actually shooting the scene. Let's go ahead and we'll take actually a look at an example here. We'll go back to the beginning and we'll bump up the resolution to full. And let's just zoom in here on the NXO4. And we'll turn this layer off. Now the difference is subtle, but it's definitely there you get edges that are much less sharp and blended in together, much more like an actual real camera would do um, when you're shooting at this resolution. And here you can also see the glow taking effect as well. And this just gives you a nice little light wrap, which also helps blend your scene together. So let's go ahead and jump back into 3ds Max real quick, and we'll take a look at how we get these different passes. So over here in the rendering setup, I'm using V-Ray, but you can uh, use a similar process with any renderer because all renderers give you render passes. And I talked about this a little bit in the last tutorial as well, but I always save everything as an RPF file. This will get you... Um, RPF files will store your camera animations and you can actually bring those into After Effects, which is incredibly useful. And if we come over here to our render elements, we can see the various elements I have enabled here for rendering. And if we just click up here on add, you can add all sorts of different elements. And many of these are very useful. For instance, atmosphere is really good if you're simulating explosions. And some of my favorite render passes are, as we talked about before, the reflection and self-illumination and specular passes here. But I always render out more than I think I'll need because there's nothing more frustrating than doing a 50 hour plus render and realizing you need a render pass that you didn't make. So let's just jump over here into our scene and we'll take a look at how everything is set up. We'll jump into the top view. And we have some light sources here. We have our ships. We have the, uh, somewhere around here, yeah, underneath that ship, we have the dry dock. And let's start by taking a look at the planet, because that's a big thing I want to cover here, is the process for rendering nice looking planets. So we'll just grab these three spheres, whoops, and hide unselected. And let's jump into the material editor. So to start with, this is our basic earth texture. 
It's just a, uh, a texture I found online. It's very high resolution. I will post the links in the description for you. It's 16K. So it's freaking huge. I mean, this is how far we have to zoom in to get full res. And the material setup is quite simple, actually. We just have our diffuse and our reflection or spec map and a bump map, which I, yeah, I'm using here. And so the earth spec map is, I couldn't find as high of a resolution one for free. I could have made one out of the 16K, but this was just, it wasn't necessary to take the time to do it. This one is only 1000 by 500, but it works very well. I found this one for free online as well. And then we also have our bump map, which is quite huge. And this is a NASA image, which was free. So the land mass is actually quite simple. Let's go ahead and grab our clouds. And here in our cloud texture, this is also quite a simple texture setup. We have our diffuse map, which is also quite large. I, this is a NASA map, I believe. Once again, links will be provided, 8192 by 4096. And for our bump map, I'm actually using the same texture, but I don't always enable it. It depends on the shot. And now for the opacity, you can just use the diffuse map for your opacity map because it's already black and white and will already give you the proper colors for transparency. However, for this shot, I did not do that. I just rendered the clouds on black and then used the screen transfer mode in After Effects. This also allows me to use the cloud layer for the shadows in After Effects like I showed you earlier. Let's go ahead and get the atmosphere. Now this one is a little more complex. And we'll just go ahead and grab our picker. I told you. But it's not as bad as it looks actually. So if we come in here to our actual material, What we have is a gradient ramp in the diffuse map. And basically these are the colors that you're seeing in the render. Let's go ahead and take a look at that real quick like. Our base render here. And this blue edge here is what you're seeing right here. And then the white is right here in the gradient ramp. And we have our gradient set to normal. And it's all pretty standard. And then if we go into our self-illumination, this is very important. We actually have a fall-off map. And our fall-off map is actually using, for part of it, our gradient ramp that we just talked about. So let's move these out of the way so we can get a clearer picture. So this is a mixed curve here. And I just sort of played with these settings until I got a look that I wanted. And the falloff type is shadow light. This basically means that when the object is being hit by a light, the self-illumination will be visible. And when it's in shadow, it will not be self-illuminated. And by using our gradient ramp that we also used in the diffuse map, we are effectively making the atmosphere model brighten itself by itself, if that makes sense. It's using the same diffuse colors to make it brighter. And when there's in shadow, it just won't do anything. And then if we come down to our opacity, we have another gradient ramp. And this is pretty simple. If you look at it as the typical black is completely uh, transparent and white is completely opaque. And so right here in our spectrum, it will be opaque. So if we just zoom in here and let's uh, let's just move this around, for example. You see how the opacity changed there. Let's add another white just to make it a little more clear. And you see how the opacity is changing on this. This is all that gradient ramp is doing. And that is the basics of our atmosphere layer. And when we render it, we come up with this. And so now what the process is, is to render each of these objects separately. But before we do that, we have to take a look at our lighting. So let's go ahead and unname, unhide by name. 
and we'll just get all of our lights. So basically the way the lights are set up for this scene is we have different lights working to do different things. We actually have two direct lights in the exact same position pointing to the exact same position. And if we look at this one and we go to our exclude panel, it is excluding from shadow casting the atmosphere. Now the reason this is important especially if you are going to render this out as one uh, layer instead of rendering it in three separate passes, is um, if the atmosphere is casting shadows and you're basically just going to have this big sphere, which is the atmosphere, making everything under it black, including the clouds and the landmass. And then if we go over here and click on Direct 001, we are once again excluding the atmosphere from shadow casting. And another important thing to note is that both of these lights in their advanced effects are targeting only specific channels. So Direct 001 is only going to hit the Diffuse channel. It's not going to affect speculars or reflections or anything like that. And Direct 02, 002 is only going to affect the specular channel. And that's basically all you need to light the planet. And so if we pop back over here into After Effects, those direct lights were used to light the planet. And for the clouds. And also for the atmosphere. Now, what's important is that I didn't render these out as traditional passes. I actually rendered them in a separate render entirely. So I rendered the ships in the dry dock and then I rendered the planet. And what makes this easier is using these other light sources because when we go up here into render setup in V-Ray, we can go to our global switches and we can turn off hidden lights. So any lights that are hidden will not affect the render. So if we select our two direct lights and our planets, when we render the planets, these are the only lights that are gonna be rendering, these two lights. And when we render the ships, conversely, we will hide the planet and the direct lights. And now the only main light we'll have on our ships is this spotlight here. And the reason I wanted to do it this way was so that I didn't have to worry about setting up a light source that would properly hit the planet and the ships. I've essentially faked it. And this is usually the approach to take if you want to get the best looking results. And once again, there's no magic settings here. There's nothing in the include or exclude or in the advanced effects that's targeting diffuse and specular. And this is basically our key light or our main light for our ships. And then if we jump into our perspective view here, we have a couple other lights to add to the scene. I have this blue light and what this is essentially doing is it's not very bright, but it's simulating the bluish reflected color cast off the planet. And you can see that if we come back in here and turn on our main comp, Let's just actually jump into that comp. And this blue light that's hitting the ship here is essentially supposed to be reflected light from the planet. But if we actually used reflected light, it wouldn't be that strong. So I just added an additional light in there. And this light here, it's essentially the same thing. It's just another light source I added to augment the scene. And then finally, we have a dome light. And this is not very bright at all, but what the dome light does is it adds a subtle ambient kind of light to the scene. And it really helps bring out your details with an ambient occlusion effect. And this is actually typically much faster than rendering with GI, but gives you a similar effect. And that's basically it for the setup of the planet and the ships. Next, next let's talk about the camera. Now, one thing I really like from the J.J. Trek movies, as well as actually the second one, is when the ships go to warp, the camera kind of sits behind here. And it does this huge zoom out, which makes it look like the ship is stretching. And this is, I think, um, an homage to what we've seen in other Star Treks where when the ship goes to warp, it actually stretches, but just not in this kind of manner. And what's actually happening here is with the camera... 
when it lines up behind the ship here, I've just animated the focal length from what it was at 77.84, and it goes all the way down to 13.233. And this will give that very wide look. And for those of you who aren't familiar with focal length and how it works, is that when you're zoomed in more, the shot essentially gets compressed and it makes everything look closer together and bigger. And when you're zoomed out, it makes everything look really long and wide and stretched. You see this effect a lot in movies and TV where they want to make a, look a build, make a building look tall. So they'll go from the ground angle and they'll shoot up with a really wide angle and it just makes things look looming. You also see this when you want to make a person look tall. You often shoot from a low angle with a really wide lens, etc. And so that's all that is. And then finally, we have our particle effect. And this is just a basic uh, particle flow source in 3ds Max. It's nothing too special. Um, position object. What I've done is I've just positioned it on each ship's engines for each render, and I've rendered done a separate render for each particle effect. And it's just uh, it emits. It starts emitting at 240, stops at 251 when the ship is away. And there's a very low speed on it, so it doesn't go zooming away. And it just uses a self-illuminated material, nothing too special, and the shape is just tiny spheres. And then finally, for this shot, and for many of the shots in the film, I have the lights. And I talked about the script in the previous tutorial, it's the AE Transform Exporter. I will post links once again in the description. And this is a wonderful tool, especially combined with your RPF Exporter, uh, which takes your camera where you can very easily get 3D between your scenes in 3ds Max and After Effects or whatever compositor you happen to be using. And so what I've done here is I've set up these spheres on the engines and on the cells, and I've linked them to the ship. And if we just right click and go to object properties, they are not renderable. So they're essentially dummies, but I like spheres because they're easy to see. And if we go over here to our AE transform exporter and copy to clipboard, this will copy the motion of whatever is selected for the entire range of the animation. And now you see AE keyframe data has been copied to your clipboard. And we just come into here in our comp and we add a light and we can paste the keyframes. So just paste it over that light that's already there and voila. Now, I have done this for every source in the scene which will be emitting some sort of light or lens flare. And so, as you can see for the NX04, since it's closest to the camera, I actually have six, seven, eight, nine, ten different light sources that I've copied using this method. Now, the thing that can get kind of tricky with your RPF camera is the zooms. It will actually not copy your focal length from 3ds max so let's just go ahead here and just for a basic example we'll set up a new comp so we'll drag in scene 75 main and we'll go we'll right click on it go to keyframe assistant and choose rpf camera import and now our camera is in the scene but we have to copy the focal length so if we double click on the camera, we can see it comes in with a default focal length of 35. And if we come into 3ds Max, we'll just select our camera and we'll copy our initial focal length of 77.84 and paste it in there. And now let's just go grab one of our lights. And as you can see, the light is now locked to that nacelle. The problem is though, when we start zooming, it's gonna get wonky. 
So basically the way we do this is just to hand keyframe the zoom in After Effects. Now I should point out too that there are plugins to get all of this information from 3ds Max to After Effects. Most notably, the only one on the market that I've really been able to find is Max 2AE, but it's quite expensive. And this method is free. So it requires a little bit more legwork, but it works in most cases just as well in the end. So if we drop down here into our camera, we can see our zoom and it's set to 44, 28.1 pixels. That's not a focal length. What is that? I, it, it's, it's useless. But if we adjust this, we can see the light essentially moving because we are zooming the camera in and out. So the way to handle this is to pop over in the max and select our camera and find the frame at which we start zooming. So if we just right click and go to our curve editor so we can more easily see our keyframes, we'll come down here to our focal length and we see that we start zooming at frame 184. So we'll come over here into After Effects and let's just make a copy of our camera. And we'll shut that off for a second. And on our bottom camera, we will at frame 184, We'll set our zoom, we'll set the stopwatch for the zoom so we've created a keyframe. And now on our top camera, we'll go back into 3ds Max, we'll find the frame we stopped zooming at, which is 240. And we'll grab our focal length here, which is 13.233 millimeters. We'll take our top camera that we made just a second ago, and we'll put this in for a focal length. And if we drop down into camera options now for this camera, we can see that our zoom is 752.8 pixels. So we'll just click in there and we'll control C to copy. And we'll drop down into our original camera and we'll move ahead to frame 240, which is where the zoom ends. And we will click in here in the, in the zoom pixels and we'll paste this number and now you can see that our camera more or less zooms there is a problem however see how it's doing this kind of wonky motion thing here well that is because of our graph it's just a linear line so we'll go ahead and shut that off for a second. First of all, we can get rid of this copied camera because we don't need it anymore. We just made it so we could get that pixel number. And we'll drop back down in here to our camera options on our actual camera. And we'll click this little graph button next to zoom. And then we'll turn the graph editor on up here. And we'll take a look at our keyframes. So let's just zoom in here to get a better look at it. And if we come back over here into 3ds Max, this is the part where we have to essentially do it by hand. If we look at our curve, it's very smooth. We don't have this straight line stuff. If we do that, whenever you have that kind of curve, your motion is gonna be very stuttery. This smooths it out. So what we want to do is emulate that curve in After Effects. So if we right click on our keyframe, and go to keyframe assistant and choose easy ease. Now we can start to see how we're getting there. And let's click on our second one, right click keyframe assistant, easy ease. And now we can adjust these handles to adjust the amount at which the curve is eased. And so basically the best way to do this is just to look at our footage and see if our light stays locked onto our source. So we can see it's starting to slide there. So we're going to take this handle and we're just going to move it forward. And let's go ahead down here towards the end. And we'll adjust this handle. And that's getting pretty close. And what you want to do now is you just want to adjust this until everything stays in position while you zoom. And now we look like we're pretty much spot on there. So that is the basic method for getting things from 3ds max 
into After Effects. So let's just do a quick recap on everything we've looked at here. We copied our camera from Max to After Effects using this wonderful AE Transform Exporter script, which is free. We've copied lights over to use as a source for our optical flares. And then we've also animated the focal length of our camera based on our keyframes from 3ds Max. And just finally, if we want to add our lens flare, we'll just do a new solid. We'll go Effect, Video Copilot, Optical Flares. And we'll set it to Track Lights. And oftentimes, but depending on the shot, I will just disable all of these and disable 3D Perspective, which will keep the light source at a constant size and shape, no matter what the distance, and it will only follow the position. So we'll set the mode to add and voila. And now all you'll want to do is to keyframe your brightness and go into options and change what your flare looks like. I have a couple presets that I use and modify. This is, I think the one I used for the warp flare. And uh, maybe we can turn those spots off. And it's important to note that this is a really valuable plugin, not just for doing obvious lens flares, but whenever you want to just simulate a radiant light source in your scene. It makes it very quick when you just need a point of light or when you need this kind of foggy effect. One thing I use often is this volume light. And all of that is, is let's see, we come in here to custom objects and we'll go to TriStar, whoops. And that's just the streak, essentially. And uh, we'll change the replicator copies to one. And then you can just play with the size, etc. And this is very, 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 very useful whenever you need a volume light source anywhere in your scene. So that is the gist of how this shot was achieved. And this is the basic approach for every shot in the film. And just as an example, Let's go take a quick look at another shot. And this is a shot that is uh, the scene in the first teaser. So if we come in here to our, uh, this one actually has a couple of comps because there's more usage of optical flares. And once again, it's important to point out that you're not always using it for a typical lens flare. Sometimes you're just using it to augment a light source. As I'm doing here, I have one on here just to make this engine brighter, etc. But if we come into this comp, it's once, once again the same basic method. I've pre comped things a little bit differently in this one just to make organization a bit easier. But if we come in here to ship, and you'll notice in this one I actually rendered my stars in 3ds Max. Sometimes that's easier too. It just depends on the scene. For this one it was easier because it's a 360 degree shot. And having all those image planes in After Effects gets to be very slow. So I just used the textured sphere in 3ds Max. But for this one we started out with our standard RGB color pass. And this, these are used at the end. And then we come in here, we add our reflection pass, and already you can see how nice that makes it look. It just gives it a really nice metallic sheen. And then we have our specular pass. And you can't see it too well in this angle. Let's go ahead and jump ahead to where the oblique angle of the light is hitting the hull. So without speculars and with, it just gives it that nice kind of bloomy look wherever the light is shining. And then we have our self illumination pass for the windows and the deflector dish and what have you. And then also the chromatic aberration is there as well. And then you come back into this comp. And one thing I've done here is once again, in using optical flares to bolster a light source that's already in the scene, is I've essentially used it to enhance these reflections to make them a bit more bloomy as they would with an actual camera. So let's just take a quick look at that. 
And it's important to note too that these were hand keyframed. I did not use a light for these because sometimes that is easier as well. It's this layer called specular. There's a couple layers of specular. And it's just this simple optical flare light source. And there's another one. And all it does is follow the path of the specular hits that we get on the hull. And then once again, we have a planet in the background. And here you can see I've also have some lights for right here. It's a, one of the running lights on the hull, etc. And once again, where our reflection maps come in very handy is you get really nice reflections like right here off these sensor pods on under the hull in these dark areas. Now on our base render, it's there, but it's quite hard to see. And once you start adding in your passes, those kind of things get brought out really, really nicely. And then also in this shot, I had some weapons fire. And for those of you who are wondering, they are not quantum torpedoes. And for this, if we just come down here to our base render, I actually rendered out of 3ds Max these little self-illuminated capsules. And doing that in Max gives you this really nice little reflection off the hull. And then I copied them into After Effects as light sources. And you can see the light sources are following the capsules. And then I used optical flares to essentially augment the capsules. So once again, it's really just the same process used over and over again. And as I'm sure you can tell from this, it is a very lengthy process. I mean, I've spent probably close to an hour here just talking about the basic process of doing two shots that are only a few seconds long. And now apply that to a two hour movie where basically everything is CG. But with that, I will now take my leave of you for this video tutorial. I hope you found it useful. If you have any questions, be sure to let me know, shoot me a message, post in the comments. Uh, you can also contact via the Horizon Facebook page or the official website. And um, thank you for watching. And please check back soon for more updates and, of course, a new trailer on the film coming in another month or two. Thanks for watching.